pretty cool. All right, so I have, yeah, so far I'm only drawing uh, the things. Uh, the queer mutation, reversal errors connected to K. And what's the, uh, and the last one was delete all uh, pairs of opposite arrows that we have created uh, on step on step one. And so uh, what about seed mutation? Okay, thank you. Yes, that's that's great. Uh, uh, oh, okay, so one more, I need to say one more thing, which is that uh, last time I got asked whether, um, so last time I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that if you start with a path quiver, if Q is a path quiver, and then you mutate in all possible ways, you get uh, you get cattle and many, cattle and many uh, other quivers if you just do all possible mutations. And so uh, I said that it's probably hard. Well, actually, it's not only is it not hard, but it's easy to see from what we already know. So I wanted to clarify that because. Um, so um, so here's here's the idea. Let's say I what I want is I want to come up with a triangulation. So I want want a triangulation T. Uh, and so each triangulation can be converted to a quiver to a quiver Q and I want the quiver to be such that uh, such that mutable vertices form a path. So yeah, if I start with the pentagon, then uh, my mutable vertices are here and then the arrow is going like this. So that's a path. I wonder, can you tell me what such a triangulation would be in general? Also, c can you remind me what's... Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, no, I just want... Uh, so I, I, I'm just saying find a triangulation whose mutable quiver, mu whose, mu whose mutable part of the quiver is a path. is some orientation of a path. But let's just, like, let, let's start, can you remind me what's the rule for the quiver from a triangulation, like in general? Okay.
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's right. So if I have a triangulation like this, then I put a mutable vertex on every diagonal and a frozen vertex on every side, and then I just kind of draw clockwise triangles inside every triangle, and I always kind of ignore the arrows between the boundary vertices. Okay, so in this case the mutable quiver is not a path. Uh, however, if I choose a different triangulation, maybe it becomes a path. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's already pretty explicit, I would say. Right, so you can, in general, you can just kind of, let's see if I can draw an eight gone. In general, you just kind of do a zigzag triangulation. Zigzag. You just kind of uh, draw a diagonal, and then you you kind of, you have the two endpoints. You you first move this po this endpoint here, and then you draw a diagonal. You know, just so you draw this diagonal, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. And so then your uh, your mutable quiver. Yeah, you could also do that. Just uh, uh, th that that's all that also works. And then you're going to get different orientations. Yeah. So, um, and now the point is that as you, in a triangulation, you can flip any diagonal, which means that in the corresponding quiver, you can flip any, well, this quiver is kind of, uh, there is no, but yeah, the point is that in, in the freeze pattern world, so for freeze patterns, you kind of, you can't mutate a, a vertex that's not either a source or a sink, something like this. Can't mutate this guy. But uh, in a triangulation, it, let's say you, yeah, let, let's say, let me follow. Uh, if I just draw all diagonals from the same vertex, then uh, my mutable quiver is going to look like this. So it's going to be all oriented in the same direction. And now here I can actually can mutate any vertex. So I can can mutate this vertex even though it has an incoming and an outgoing arrow. And so as I mutate this vertex, I'm gonna instead get an interior, interior triangle, and so inst inside of that I'm gonna have a cycle. But the point is that because you can mutate any diagonal, you can, like uh, all the quivers you get are gonna come from triangulations. And different triangulations are gonna give you different quivers. And so, um, so the point is that, uh, well, I guess you need you need to do some work to kind of figure out why different triangulations give you different quivers. But basically, uh, the quivers are labeled. So, yeah. So the point is that you get kind of many quivers, and the, and those those are all the possible quivers for the path graph. Is that clear? Any any questions? Any questions on that or on the homework or, or any kind of previous material? All right. I do not see any questions. Now, um, so today what I want to address is question that nobody seems to be asking, which is, what is a cluster algebra? Somehow I have spent, was it two weeks? Three, three, yeah, two weeks without talking about cluster algebras. So, cluster.
master algebras. And so, uh, yeah, the definition is not going to be satisfactory to you. Somehow it's just, it's just something which may or may not look important. But nevertheless, here's a definition. So um, first, the first thing you do is you fix a field. Fix, this is called the ambient field. F. In so if in just so it's just going to be the field of rational functions in some variables u1, u2, all the way up to um. This m is the same m as the size of an extended cluster. And now, so here is the definition. Before, when I was defining seeds, I was being vague about. Uh, you know, seed is a labeling of a quiver by some rational functions. Well, okay, here is a, here is what I mean by some rational functions. So a seed is a pair x tilde comma q, where q is an ice quiver. And x tilde is again x1, x1, x2, all the way up to xm. So q is an ice quiver um, with n vertices, vertices and sorry, m vertices and n uh, mutable vertices. Right, so m minus n frozen vertices. And so this is a labeling of a labeling of the vertices of q by which rational functions? By so first of all they have to be algebraically independent. Uh, independent elements of the amb of the ambient field. So, for example, you could just take these variables u one through u m. But in general, uh, they have to be algebraically independent, and they have to uh, they have to freely kind of de generate f as a field. Yeah, I guess over c. So anyway, you're allowed to, if you if you just take these x1 through xm and you multiply and divide and multiply them by complex numbers in all possible ways, you get the whole field. So yeah, those of you who know about field extensions and stuff like that should be uh, should be very comfortable with this with this notion here. Um, yeah, so that's that is what I actually mean by a seed. So there's always this kind of ambient field. And so uh, now, now here's the definition of a cluster algebra. Mm -hmm. What I do is I, so first of all, I fix some initial, some what is called initial seed, which is x tilde q. So you define a cluster algebra by first choosing a seed. You, you choose a seed, just a bunch of rational functions which are independent, and some quiver. And then a cluster algebra is, uh, well, there you go. So first of all, um, well, okay, what I want to do is I want to, first of all, I want to mutate this seed in all possible ways. Mutate the seed x tilde comma q in all possible ways. And so as I do that, I get possibly infinitely many other seeds. Um, so the, the elements, so whenever, uh, as you mutate, You get these new seeds like x tilde prime, q prime, and so 
uh, what I want to say is that the, the elements of these all these new seeds are called cluster variables. Elements of these x tilde prime are called cluster variables. So in principle, there could be infinitely many cluster variables. And they form kind of, they group in different ways. And I'm going to say that, uh, so I'm going to say that, um, say that the elements of, of a given x tilde prime form a cluster. Right, so there is, you can imagine kind of infinitely many different functions or whatever, but then some groups of them are called clusters, right? So that's just the combinatorial data that you get by taking the seed and just mutating it in all possible ways. And so finally, the cluster algebra is a, so cluster algebra, which is gonna be denoted a, of x tilde comma q is the subalgebra of the ambient field, uh, right? Okay, of f, uh, which is generated generated by all cluster variables plus by frozen variables and their inverses. X n plus one, all the way up to X m, plus or minus one, plus or minus one. Right. Okay, so once again, what I'm, what I'm gonna do is you start with a seed, mutate it in all possible ways, and then you get some bunch of cluster variables, right? by just looking at the functions you get by mutating them. And then you're allowed to add them together, multiply. So, so the point is that you're not allowed to divide by cluster variables. But everything else, you can multiply and add things together, multiply them by a complex number, things like that. But you are allowed to, so you are allowed to divide, um, divide by frozen. Okay. I don't know, is, does that look satisfactory to you? Or is, is it, what, what, what do you, what is your feeling about this definition? Okay, no. Right, I, I see. So um, I guess you're saying that uh, this definition seems like we forget which of them form a cluster and whatever. But that usually you consider a cluster algebra together with this extra information about what, which, what, which things are cluster variables and which of them form a cluster. So yeah, that's usually considered part of the data. So, but yeah, so, so the only kind of new I'm only add, adding information at this point, which is I'm adding this object, which is an, which is an algebra. And so um, I guess I guess I want to do some kind of examples next, just to play with the definition and see what what's going on. So yeah, okay, examples. Mm. Which I mean, it's if you if you try 
let, let me try some easy examples and then uh, and then uh, let's say now I'm gonna try a complicated example so first let's say Q is just a single vertex labeled by one and uh, well let's say it's labeled by uh, so the seed X tilde is just X1 and let's say this is mutable just just one mutable vertex then what do you get what is the cluster algebra so what happens when i yeah, what happens if i take my quiver with one vertex and when i mutate at a at a single vertex what do i get Yeah, thank you, that's correct. So cluster algebra is just the uh, the ring of Laurent polynomials in one variable, right? Because when I mutate, I get the quiver stays the same, but instead of x1, I get like 2 over x1 or something like this, right? But since I'm allowed to multiply by complex numbers, I can get rid of the 2, and so I get a, I get a, I'm allowed to look at polynomials in X1 and X1 inverse. And that's exactly the Laurent polynomial ring. Now, okay. Well, that may be, that may sound like an interesting ring. Let me try another example. So, another example. Let's say Q is a quiver with one mutable vertex and one frozen vertex. And x tilde is x1, x2. So, so the first step is I mutate in all possible ways, right? So what's going to happen if I so I have this quiver x1 and x2? So which mutations do I do I do? Okay, so I can apply mu1, and then what happens to the quiver? Uh, x2, okay, and the arrow, I guess, is going like this. Yeah, okay, so that's good. And what happens if I mutate again? Okay, yes, that's true. Uh, X1 and X2. All right, so I have mutated in all possible ways. And so the, uh, the cluster algebra, X tilde comma Q, is generated by what is it x1 and x2 and then 1 plus x2 over x1 is that it or yes also x2 inverse okay so i'm allowed to multiply yeah, I mean, this is a pretty random example, just a small one. So I'm allowed to multiply any combination of these things together and add any several such combinations, which is, I mean, now you can ask questions like, what, you know, question does, let's say, what, what do I, does x2 over x1 belong to A? I mean, it's not, uh, what do you think? Does it belong or does it not belong? Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, I see a few people are saying it does not belong. Yeah, I guess the answer, I actually haven't really checked. I think the answer is no, but I mean, the point is that you have to kind of do some work. You know, some functions are gonna belong to your field. Okay, let, let's see some, some function that, that does belong, but none obviously so. Yeah, I guess that it's not, a, yeah, I mean, you know, let me just write down some obvious, like one plus x2 or one plus x2 over x1, x2, etc. like these. These belong to the cluster algebra. Anyways, so the point is that it's some ring and it, usually it's hard to decide which functions belong and which don't belong. Or maybe, I mean, in this case it wasn't that hard, but you know, I mean, th these elements are not algebraically independent, so you're, you're going to get some non-trivial ring. That's the point. But what, what's actually the point is that, uh, well, okay, first of all, let me formulate. I, I think you, you all already anticipate this uh, from a while ago, but still let me state a theorem. A theorem which is that uh, any cluster variable So remember there is, cluster variables are just all possible things I can get by mutating the seed. Any cluster variable uh, can be written as a Laurent polynomial in the initial extended cluster with positive uh, integer coefficients. So that's the first nice structural result about cluster algebras. You, know, you draw any quiver, just do in a lot of mutations, and then you get you always get Laurent polynomials, right? And, and so there's going to be cancellations, and then you always get these positive integer coefficients, just as in the sum of four sequence. And so here on the left, I have a a bunch of references for you to read, I guess. Uh, so the first one by Fomin Zelovinsky is where they introduced cluster algebras. And so they proved the Laurent phenomenon, but, and they conjectured positivity. They made a lot of conjectures, but basically they gave the definition of cluster algebras and kind of proved some first properties. So the point is that Laurent, phenom Laurent phenomenon can be proved you can read the proof in the book. It's a few pages long. I don't think I'm gonna explain it in class, but I, I mean, I'll try if you really press me really hard, but you know, let's just say this homework. But then uh, the positivity conjecture was open for quite a while and then it was proven. So for quivers, as we work with right now, it was proven by, yeah, let me actually write it down. So I'm in. Zelovinsky, Zelovinsky, they proved the Laurent phenomenon and conjectured positivity. And then uh, Lee and Schiffler, you see it's in 2015, that's pretty recent. They proved positivity for quivers and then well anyway the point is that I am there is a more general notion of a cluster algebra which I'm going to explain but it's going to it's going to be a little bit later where instead of a quiver you take like a skew symmetrizable matrix uh, it I mean it doesn't give you that much but the point is that uh, the full in full generality that was proven by these GHKK uh, in 2018. So positivity uh, in full generality. Let's just say. Yeah. So so I guess that's basically what I want to say about it. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah, one thing you have to 
pay attention as a grad student, which I guess many of you don't do, is you have to kind of learn which journals are good and which aren't good. And so, yeah, I just memorize the top 20 journals is my advice to you. That That's going to help a lot with kind of navigating around. Yeah, and so the top two journals are uh, Journal of American Mathematical Society and Annals of Mathematics. And so somehow all these papers, I just noticed that somehow in this in this lecture all papers are from either one of these two journals. So, uh, not sure what the message of that is supposed to be. Uh, okay, but now let me go back to. I mean, this is a nice property, but let me go back to why why would you introduce cluster algebras? And so the reason for for this definition. And there's originally there was two reasons which I'm going to discuss later, but for now let me focus on the kind of what I think is the most important one, which is that uh, cluster algebras somehow very surprisingly turn out to be isomorphic as rings to coordinate rings uh, of some interesting of interesting algebraic varieties and so uh, let me first point out that I don't I do not expect you to know what is an algebraic variety or what is a coordinate ring. Uh, I'm going to explain it a little bit later, but uh, for now, let me give you an example of such a situation. So the example I'm going to give is that the, so the variety in question is going to be the Grossmannian 2 comma n and so, well, an algebraic variety is basically a, a set of points defined by some polynomial equations, multivariate polynomial equations. And so the Grassmannian uh, is defined by, well, uh, it's defined by the set of planes in the n-dimensional space, so that's not really helpful, but uh, you can think of it as the, the ring of the space of Plucker, kind of all possible Plucker coordinates, modular Plucker relations, right? Well, I mean, not modular, but the space of all, uh, I mean, you just basically take Plucker coordinates which satisfy Plucker relations. And if they satisfy Plucker relations, then they give you an element of the Grassmannian. So, so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip, just skip this discussion of algebraic varieties for now and of coordinate rings as well, but I'm just going to tell you what is the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian 2 comma n. So this denotes, this denotes the coordinate ring. Right. It's, it's basically this, the ring of all polynomial functions on your variety. And so in this case, it turns out to be the, so what you do is you take the polynomial ring in the Plucker coordinates, P, I, J, where I and J, um, where I is just less than J. Take this ring and then you mod out by the Plucker coordinates. So by the ideal generated by Plucker coordinates, which in this case is, uh, P A C P B D minus P A B P C D minus P uh, A D P B C. Right there, one just for all quadruples um, Is it clear what I'm saying? Yes, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
well, okay, what I'm saying is just forget all that and I'm defining a, I'm introducing a ring. Take the polynomial ring in and choose too many variables and then mod out by the ideal generated by and choose four relations. But, but that ring has a geometric meaning regarding the Grassmannian. And that generalizes to all, like not only Grassmannian 2n, but kn in general. And so, okay. Now, the other object we had associated to the Grassmannian is, well, you can take t, you can take t to be a triangulation, right? Let's say I take a an n gone and then uh, I draw the diagonal diagonals and then we kind of, we can kind of label we can to a triangulation we can associate a seed and the so you get a quiver and then and then the vertices are going to be labeled by these p a p i j's so p p one two p two three etc p1, 3, p3, 5, something like this. And these are, so the pijs are naturally Pluca coordinates, right? Um, so, well, I mean, what, what do I mean naturally? I, I already told you that a seed is I just choose some kind of arbitrary functions. So I can, I can choose them to be just some variables. But then I have a, uh, I have a homomorphism homomorphism from the cluster algebra so let's say the seed is x tilde q then I have this homomorphism uh, from the cluster algebra to the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian uh, where I send you know pij maps to pij Right, where this here it's treated as like a variable or an element of some ambient field, but here it's treated as a as an element of this ring here. Right. Okay. Any any questions so far? I know this is a little. Actually, there is a there is a one good question you can ask right now, which is you can point out that I'm cheating a little bit. So somehow the statement, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's correct. So this this statement here is just wrong. Uh, for the reason that in a cluster algebra I have these frozen variables which are allowed to be inverted. So A of X tilde comma Q contains P I comma I plus one inverse. Right? And uh, but the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian mm. does not, which is, I mean, just by definition, there is no, uh, well, I, I guess it requires some work, but it, you can show that this PII plus one is not invertible, 
and the reason, I mean, these are polynomial functions on the grass minor. And on the grass minor, you, you're allowed to have uh, adjacent minors to be zero, in which case this becomes non-invertible. So, uh, okay. So, uh, what do I, how do I resolve this issue? And the, the reason is that sometimes uh, the, just the definition of the cluster algebra is slightly different. In that, uh, so the where the inverse is x plus one, x plus x m inverse are not included in the in the list of generators. So yeah, in, in some papers and some books, they are included. In some others, they are not. And it, usually, it's a very minor distinction. Like here, if I, uh, for the case of the Grassmannian, if I forbid to include these things as generators, then indeed, I get such a, homo such a homomorphism. And it's an isomorphism. So OK. without, if you define cluster algebra without these x plus one x, x, x m inverse, indeed uh, the cluster algebra of x tilde q is isomorphic to the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian two comma n. Um, yeah, and so that, that was proved by uh, Scott, but uh, yeah. Anyway, in the case of the Grassmannian, it's yeah. Okay, let me ask: Is there any more questions right now? I know I'm being unclear, but uh, it's it's a little bit. It's just a subtle point where you know there is no consensus. By now, it's pretty uh, well established to include these generators, as I did in the original definition. But uh, in 2006, it was kind of up in the air, basically. All right. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's easy to see that in, the, in this case I don't get, right? Because whenever I apply a flip, so let's say here I want to flip a diagonal, I divide by P13, but what happens is I get P24. Like P13 cancels out with, so when I mutate P13, I get P12, P34, plus P14, P23, divided by P13, which looks like it does not belong to the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian. But then, using the Pluck relations, you can transform the numer numerator as P13 times P24, so the result is equal to P24, which belongs to the coordinate ring. And because, because you can mutate any diagonal in any triangulation, no matter how much you mutate, you always get things which are in this ring. Well, so yeah, still I have to be careful. So when it's written in this form, it looks like it doesn't belong. But then, so there is, kind of, there is some algebraic dependence between things in different clusters. So you have this kind of, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's a good question, which is actually, and yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and it's a source of, of the whole difficulty in proving this theorem, 
right? You have to kind of, uh, well, if, if instead of a two, you have a general K, then there is a whole bunch of problems. Like, is it true that you get all of this ring by, uh, by mutating in all possible ways? Do you get any extra things when you mutate which don't belong to this ring? And etc. So, so in a sense, this theorem is not completely—it's uh, not at all trivial, but it is true. And yeah, I guess I'm out of time. Let me let me finish by asking one more one more questions. S one more question. Question: If we include these generators, x m plus one inverse to x m inverse uh, as generators as I did uh, officially as generators in the in the definition I gave originally in this class if I include these things uh, does that correspond to some interesting space So it's not going to be the Grassmannian, because right? on the Grassmannian, the frozens are not invertible. But is there some interesting kind of, maybe like a sub-variety of this guy, which, uh, which corresponds to our official definition of the cluster algebra? And so, and it turns out that the answer is, the answer is yes. Yes, and it's a very, interesting space which I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna uh, continue next time talking about this space and if you have any questions let me know if not I will see you on Friday the homework is due in one week from now yeah, that's it thank you